like, comment, share, and subscribe. Hit that notification bell in the upper right hand corner. Follow me on all forms of social media. Check me out at thedrummerguy.com and enjoy the following presentation. Yo, buddy, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? Good, man. Six cups of coffee in, a constant stream of urine. <laughs> Oh, that's quite all right. I, I can imagine uh, during uh, the press cycles that are going on right now that, uh, you know, just uh, getting that coffee in you is just like a good way to be able to get through it. And of course, having yeah, your own I bathroom. I dread that first interview in the morning because I'm just not online yet. You know what I mean? So it's like you're trying to make sure that you, uh, you know, it's like um, somebody had even talked in interviews the other day about, uh, you know, how social media is and everything. And dude, it's like it's a minefield unless you're unless you're ready for it. Right. So so uh, coffee is my best line of defense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a great way to go about it. I'm drinking the same here, and uh, it's a uh, it's a great uh, connection right here. I mean, uh, both being able to get drink some coffee, uh, getting through the day, and uh, talking about uh, what you got going on musically right now. Good man, hit me. Uh, well, well, again, uh, thank you uh, very much for taking the time to be able to do this. Uh, when I first started off, uh, my first year of doing interviews, I was uh, thankful enough to be able to uh, talk to you on the tour bus on uh, St. Paul, Minnesota one, uh, during the Catatonia Paradise Lost and Stolen Babies tour, so it's awesome to be able to catch up after all this time, and now I'm getting to talk about uh, the new live CD and Blu-ray uh, featuring uh, an incredible show that you were able to do uh, overseas, uh, being able to play all of Ocean Machine live in a best-of set with a full-on orchestra. I mean, how does it feel in hindsight now looking back at that show? Well, I get asked that. Every interview has been asking that, obviously, as you, as you would. And, you know, I, I, I feel embarrassed to a certain extent that the the venue itself didn't hold as much significance as I think people thought it would for me. But I, the show was amazing. I was just so, I felt so honored to be able to play with the orchestra and choir and all that. But to be perfectly honest, it was such a busy year that the lead up to that show was, was just so stressful. And to learn all that new material, but we didn't really have the time off. So a lot of it was being learned on planes and backstage and whatever. There was an element of anxiety that came along with it that I didn't even realize we were there until was almost over i was like well I, I guess we're done now and then we went on tour the next day right <laughs> but when i was i guess the, the um the, the secondary part of the statement is when i was editing it and when i was like working on the mix and everything and i was able to see it there was a part of it just like holy shit that's what i've wanted to do for my entire life so two things on one hand it was so stressful that i didn't recognize it on the time at the time on the second hand it was something i've wanted to do for my entire life and i guess third it made me think okay in the future having done that I know what to expect now, and I know what to avoid, and I can't wait to do it again. And you know that's such a great thing to be able to hear that too. I mean, I mean, obviously, like on the on the personal level, I mean, I know there's a lot of anxiety that can come from uh, live shows, even if it's just like a standard show, let alone being able to do like a full-on production like this. But it's amazing to see how you were able to persevere through that, and being able to look back and seeing uh, all the mistakes that you made that you're able to change in the future, and just having a great experience like that, uh, looking at the positivity of it as well. well well, you know, I think a lot of what happens um, in creative endeavors for people who do things like I do professionally, a lot of what defines being able to have any sort of longevity in this is it's much less about your, your capacity to play music or the songs you have or whatever. I mean, of course, that's going to get you in the door and, and keep you there to a certain extent. But really what defines it is perseverance because there's a lot of things, you know, like um, you'll meet people. I've met people that don't do what I do professionally and their interpretation of it is like I'd love to do what you do because it seems like you know the job that they may have they might work at the mill or they might do this that or the other thing they're like man you're living the dream you don't have to get up and do your day job you get to travel you get all these sorts of things and I'm like absolutely unequivocally that is the case however there's a lot of things under the surface with it that unless you are the type of person who can be resilient enough to deal with things like being humiliated publicly or saying stupid things in interviews and having to like be held accountable for that or you know traveling relentlessly and then showing up and then fucking up a gig because your throat's messed up that you haven't slept or, or whatever you know what I mean or what's another example for, okay here's an example I don't sell a lot of records yet in some territories there's people that are super obsessive about what I do so you can't leave your hotel room you know what I mean like there'll be people waiting in the lobby or outside your hotel room and as romantic as that may sound if it's not hand in hand with like profound amounts of money to be able to like protect yourself from that shit it's it's, it's crazy, dude. It's not something that you can be prepared for. And the only way that people who do what I do, and this 
is not exclusive to me. The only way the people who do what I do can like get through that and then still be able to make music that is emotionally available for the audience is just resilience, man. You've got to be resilient. You've got to practice resilience and you've got to learn to like water off a duck's back or else, man, it'll take you down. So the Plovdiv DVD and that whole experience and the anxiety that went along with it, man, it was another lesson in how do we do this? And now on the other side of it, I realize that when I get a chance to do that again, there's a lot of things that I'll do differently and I look forward to it. Yeah, and you know you make so many great points and I've, I've learned it so much uh, over the years, especially when I'm doing interviews or uh, even on a very lesser extent whenever I've played shows you know, it's just there is that romanticism of like being able to, uh, uh, the fans just like uh, constantly wanting to bombard you with questions and stuff, whether you're on stage or you're off the stage or uh, when you're at your hotel room and stuff like that I mean, when you have anxiety like that I can imagine that it can take a toll on you but when you do get on the stage like that and you're able to have things go right and things are going the way that they should, you know, it's just, it's a great feeling being able to play the music that you created for a, a great fan base that's out there in front of you wanting to hear the music that you created. Totally, totally. And that's the skill set that goes into making it work because the audience that likes what I do, they need me to be resilient or else I wouldn't be able to do it. You know what I mean? So each one of these things that I've uh, encountered as the career has progressed, rest is training me to do this and I think what's really important for me is transparency with the audience as well like number one I hate the term fan because it seems super condescending the people who listen to what I do are fundamentally no different than you or I or anybody else it's it's a bunch of humans who we play different roles in, in each other's lives but what I think is really important for me when it comes to transparency is to be able to say the path that I've chosen and that I'm pursuing um, benefits not only me but I think if I do it correctly and if I'm able to really articulate every period of my life um, accurately I think it helps both sides of the equation it helps me clearly but I think it also helps the audience to maybe hear or see that it's like god there's there's nothing about this that is like magical there's nothing about this that that is that makes me fundamentally better or worse or have more answers or anything like that than any other human it's just the path in which um, my musical career has has taken me forces me to sort of recognize things that don't come unless you've done that right so it's symbiotic and I mean somebody had mentioned earlier they said well you know you you tend to involve your audience whether or not it's like universal choir or everybody's singing or like involving people in, in like lucky animals videos or crowdsourcing either and you know on a financial level or whatever but I think it's really important for me as an artist to do that because if you don't include people it becomes really insular really quick you know it's very easy to interpret what I do as well maybe I'm different than others because you know I'm the one that's up on the stage or I'm the one with the orchestra here happening and all this sort of thing and it's really healthy for me artistically to recognize that no I'm choosing this and it's not that it's different it's just it's not that it's oh, different's the wrong word it's not that it's um, more important less important not that I have answers it's just that's what comes with being a professional musician man so going back to resilience I have to become resilient so that the audience can enjoy it you know it's it's interesting and with that said, I mean, obviously, I mean, you you make so many great points there, and I've always felt that way. I mean, whether you're on the stage, whether you're on the side of the stage, whether you're behind the stage or you're in front of the stage, uh, people are just people, whether they're playing the music, whether they're running the sound, whether they're there just to enjoy the show. I mean, people are just people. And, exactly. You know, yeah. And exactly. And with your stuff, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of admiration for your musical ability, uh, myself being one of them, uh, with what you've created over the years but yeah just just like you said you know it's just like you are a person i mean you do have emotions and feelings and uh like myself anxiety and uh all these different things that can go around with being a person so you know being able to have that resilience to be able to put on a fun show for people to come out and see put out an amazing live cd dvd blu-ray like what's going on now and everything that you got going on in the future it's amazing to see that resilience from another human being well i think it's that's why transparency is important as well because look at it as if you're going to a carnival, right? And the people who have made this carnival, their intention for that, if it's rooted in, in something, I mean, unless their intention are purely financial, in which, the, in that case, this doesn't apply. But if the people who have made the carnival is like, I really want to make something that people can go to and there's a ride that they're on that is awesome. And the 
the ride requires, you know, you're going to sit in this thing, and at this point, there's going to be these holograms, and at this point, they're going to flip you upside down. But in order for that to work, and in order for the the, the objective of these people having a good time works, I got to think about how we're going to fund this, how you're going to be safe, so you know someone's not going to fall out of the chair when it flips upside down, and who's going to do it, and when you go through the doors, what are the people going to be wearing? All that stuff is a symbiotic relationship between the people who are putting on the carnival and the people who are coming to the carnival and neither side of it is more important it's just the experience requires each side to like contend with different things and it's the same thing as a musician i want an experience for people and i want people to participate in it in a certain way and there's a certain amount of smoke and mirrors that both sides have decided is going to be essential to it you know what i mean you want it to be a spectacle and in order for it to be a spectacle you know as an artist you can't break the fourth wall the whole time and just be like it's crazy isn't it guys isn't it crazy <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, it's like the resilience that we speak about in terms of a professional musician is no different than the people who are putting on the carnival. You know, it's just your choice is to do that carnival. Therefore, what are the parameters for that you need to take into consideration? What is the work that needs to go into it? What do you need to do to protect yourself, like liability insurance or whatever it is? It's no different. And I think that what that uh, awareness of that process brings to both sides is that we both want it to be a great fucking carnival. Both of us do. So how do we make that happen? How do we make that happen? And I think that the more I go through my career, the more I realize that that both sides, both the audience and the musicians, really just want to have something great. And so my personal work, when I'm writing, for example, goes into trying to um, be self-aware enough so that every time I do something artistically, I'm participating in it like truthfully on an emotional level. So when there are musical pieces that come out, they're, they're not just vacuous. It's not like just a bunch of bullshit that has a cool sound to it. It's like it's from the heart. But then once that's done, man, and you, you're doing this thing in Plovdiv, or we're doing like um, you know, Retinal Circus, or, or the Royal Albert Hall Show, or whatever, it's separate from that. And that point becomes technical. That becomes, you know, personal resilience, finances, crew, um, uh, you know, how do we make the this happen at the same time as this, and all that sort of thing, man. And it's fun, dude. And it's like the more I do it, and the bigger it gets, the more possibilities are there. But it's just the process is no different than it was from Ocean Machine. So there you are, full circle. Oh, absolutely. And, and speaking of that, I mean, uh, using that carnival example, I mean, that's such a great way to be able to look at it. So with, with that said, what uh, using that example, what's the next coming attractions for the Devin Townsend Carnival? <sighs> well, I think... The logo is the same if you want to look at the carnival analogy. It's still Disneyland, you know? It's just the new ride is in light of everything that has come before it. So when I disbanded DTP, when I disbanded Strapping Young Lad, these aren't flippant decisions. These aren't, and clearly they're not, because there's a lot of people that are affected by this on a personal level, and that's fucking really difficult. So my decisions to do these things aren't based in self-sabotage as much as, okay, the next ride at the carnival needs to be different because if you keep, you know, you keep going back to the same roller coaster year after year after year, I mean, there's an element of predictability that's endearing, but ultimately, even the people who are putting on the, the rides are going to get bored of it. And I think that's what happens for me. And so how do you decide what happens next? Well, it's very easy, in my opinion. You just have to be constantly aware of what your needs are as a human being. And here I am in middle life, dude. It's, this is not like 25-year-old anymore. This is like I'm 46. I'm like, how do I make the best version of myself when I'm 46? Okay, well, there's exercise, there's diet, there's taking it easy on yourself. There's, you know, um, uh, recognizing that some of the patterns that you've displayed in the past, um, your addictive patterns that at one time were maybe to do with like uh, stimulants or whatever, all of a sudden morph to work. And now I'm, I realize over the past 10 years, I've been working so obsessively that that's where that addictive tendency had gone, right? So how do you cope? with that, how you contend with that. And so you do, you find mechanisms. Once you realize that that thing is just an omnipresent part of your psychology, how do you nip it in the bud? Because if your goal is to be well-rounded and happy and, and productive, I mean, dude, addictive tendencies aren't going to do anything except for derail you. So these are just examples of what midlife has brought to me. So with those things in mind, I'm able to sit back, invest myself in the same artistic uh, process that I've always done and say, now it's different, clearly. And because it's different and because because you've analyzed it, what does it need in order
order for it to be uh, interesting, not only to the audience, but to you. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to need different musicians to do different things. And I want to work with orchestras and I want to work with choirs and I want to do uh, theatrical things. And I also have realized in the past, I get so into the social aspect of being in a band that after a while, that ends up compromising the different things that I want to do, you know? So the next things that happened for me, well, the next record's called Empath. And it's, although it's not completely defined as to what its nature is yet, but it will be by the end of the month. This is sort of the internal guideline I gave it myself. Although it's not completely defined, what it's starting to appear as, 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 as opposed to addicted was one thing, key was one thing, deconstruction was one thing, strapping was one thing. Empath is kind of a lot of things in one place. And it's very much like sort of like a patchwork quilt of, of emotional things. And what does that bring? Well, it requires different musicians. It requires different um, ways of presenting it live. It requires ways of presenting it even as an album that's that's um, very colorful and very different. And, and so as these records start coming together, as this new period of my life starts to define itself, man, it's super exciting. And I think the excitement that I have for it will ultimately be the thing that excites others because, you know, if I'm just trying to convince myself that I like something, I'm like, okay, well, look, transit Transcendence did well, therefore I should make something like Transcendence. What was it about Transcendence that was cool? Okay, copy that. Just to make sure that, you know, you can keep your audience happy. I think if I was to do that, man, my boredom with that would be so blatant that eventually everybody else is just going to follow suit. They're like, if you're bored of it, dude, there's no reason why anybody else wouldn't be. So Empath is different. I'm excited about it. And that excitement is is what I think the audience can look forward to. Uh, that, that is just so fantastic to hear. And, you know, going back to what you were just saying i just could not agree more and uh, uh being being a small musician myself and being able to uh do the interviews that i've have i can always tell when that moment comes with a musician if they're not creatively happy if they just feel like they're having to do like the cut and paste thing just to make the audience happy that the fun goes away whether that's on stage whether that's in the studio whether it's just creatively if you feel like you're creatively stifled and you're not able to be happy with the work that you're making i mean that is eventually going to show off and the audience and whoever checks out the music will eventually catch on to that if they've been around that's long it. enough. That's it, dude. And here's the here's the rub with that is I don't think it's people's faults. I don't think it's a lot of musicians' faults that they end up in that trap because there's no money in it, really. I mean, there's money to sustain it, but look at DTP. I had this band, great people, great musicians, but in order to sustain the salaries, in order to sustain the cost of insurance, jam spots, visas, you know, we're looking at 15 grand a month for very, um, like I say, lower mid-tier prog metal. And there's not a lot of money in, in, in metal to begin with, let alone the level that I find myself at, which is, it's great. It's awesome. To be able to sustain that is so incredibly rare, and I thank my management for the foresight to be able to do that. However, to sustain that, dude, means you have to work constantly. You have to tour constantly. And what happens from that is that your sphere of emotional and um, creative uh, inspiration gets limited to that it becomes a vacuum so after a while i was just like i got nothing to fucking write about all i've got to write about is the fact that i'm not being able to do the things i need to do at home i've surrounded by a bunch of people who as much as i care for them they're not my family these are people that ultimately you're you're hiring to do a job for you and as much as that sort of morphed into a um a creative thing that was that was cool for us it's still a vacuum man. so i find myself after eight years being positioned to say okay well what's next what do i do next now that I've changed, this is eight years of personal and emotional growth. How do I quantify that? I don't have time because we got a tour again next week. And then I get home and I'm like, oh my God, the house is falling apart and kids having problems at school. And, you know, wife who I've been with for 30 years is like going into midlife and she's having problems and there's financial things. And But I can't deal with it because I got jet lag and I got to go on tour again next week. So finally, I recognized, I'm like, this is within my power to stop. You know, it's within my power to say enough of this. But what's that? What what is that going to require? It's going to require hurting people. It's going to require, you know, finding money to be able to sort of give a severance pay to these people who have invested so much of their time and life into helping you with your, your theme. And God, how can you pull out the rug from these people? I mean, God, what a horrible thing to do to people. But ultimately, man, I had one of the lessons that came from the DTP thing is as I was like, I need to be selfish here. I need to say if my objectives are to make a great carnival ride for the people who are invested in this stuff, it's not going to happen 
this way because all I've got to write about right now is this insular situation that exists purely to keep the situation going. You're working so you can work. And so I stopped it. And as you can imagine, man, like the amount of the amount of um, disruption that caused for Brian and Ryan and Dave and Mike and Paul and Nick and everybody who was involved with it was massive, man. And the amount of like um, the amount of shame that I felt during that was huge, man. However, on the other side of it, I'm fucking happy as shit, man. And I am writing again in the ways that I should be writing. I made the right decision for me. And, you know, I think if there's anything that this trajectory of mine uh, requires to get that next carnival ride ready for the audience is that sometimes these steps are not easy, man. And um, the only thing that I think would be a redeeming quality to the hard decisions that have to be made is being able to sit back from them and say, okay, well, what are you going to do better next time? So going back to the Plovdiv show, what do I do better next time? When it comes to working with musicians from here on out, what do you do better next time? You know, and I think that as unfortunate as it is, because I'd love to think that I could just be a guy in a band and there's camaraderie and we're like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you know, going across the world. And I don't know if I'm just cut out for that, dude. I think that this experience and the pain that it caused to these people that I care for has made me recognize that in the future, I think I just need to hire people. And I think I just need to, as much as it sucks to not really have that camaraderie, I think that when I weigh the options out, um, this is one of the many lessons that I've learned from this DTP thing. So long story long, what do people expect next? Empath is the next record. It should be out in March. And whether or not it resonates with people, it's exactly what I should be doing. So hallelujah. And that right there, I think that's a absolutely perfect note to end on. And I, I got to thank you so much for being able to take the time to be able to be so open and honest about everything that's going on right now. I mean, whether it's a DTP, whether it's Empath, which I'll definitely be looking forward to when that releases and uh, more of the promotion starts coming off with that. And just getting inside your thoughts on everything that's going on. I mean, as uh, someone who deals with uh, mental stuff m myself, I mean, it's amazing to be able to hear your insights into what you need to do, and I, I can't fault you at all. I mean, when you, you need to be happy in life. I mean, whether you're 29, whether you're 46, whether you're 84, I mean, it doesn't matter what age that you're at. I mean, you want to be able to live life and be happy, and I'm just, I'm very thankful that you were able to uh, realize that that you need to be able to find that happiness, and it, it's going to hurt people. I mean, when you do, it does feel a little yeah selfish to be able to find your happiness but when you find that happiness you're able to grow as a person and that's so great to be able to see that you're able to do that once again and i tell you what man all these people that end up taking the hit from this stuff as unfortunate as it is they're all people that i really care about and ultimately the only thing like people are often looking at state of the world and they're just like you know how can we help or how do we protect ourselves on the other side of the of the coin right but both those things can be answered by saying you have to help yourself you can't solve a other people's problems but you can solve yours with enough work or continue to keep solving them at least and then by proxy if everybody's working on themselves then things do change man but i think the mistake is thinking that you have to solve everybody else's problems man. you can't solve anybody's problems and if solving your problems after analysis means that other people you know there's fallout from that well you either you do or you don't that's what it comes down to man and neither of those decisions are are right or wrong but you either do or you don't and i did and the result of that is it was the right decision for me and you, you live and you learn buddy